Dr. David Wexler, uh, yes. thanks for being here at the Gender Matters Men Matter event. Uh, Thank I feel you. like we've got kind of this all-star cast and you were one of the real anchors. All the work you've done in this field, everything you've written on it, uh, the presentations, uh, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you. It's a, been a pleasure to be here. You, uh, the title of your presentation was very uh, it, I know it was exciting for a lot of people and it also got me wondering how it was going to interact with what Dr. Caldwell presented yesterday. Mm -hmm. So as Dr. Caldwell, w were you in that? Did you see I it? did not hear his presentation. He discussed uh, toxic shame oh. and one of the things that he uh, promoted to us as, as almost an antidote to shame and to toxic shame uh, was self-compassion. Mm -hmm. And I saw a, a lot of those same themes in uh, what you presented today. Can you talk to self Compassion is an antidote, and anything else you can tell us is a... Yeah, I think <coughs> there's different uh, languages or different uh, images that can help describe what basically the same thing. And self-compassion, I think, is an excellent phrase or an excellent word to talk about some of the same themes that I talk about. I talk about, I use the language of called uh, being authentic and being able to uh, use distress tolerance, a term I've learned from Marshall Linehan. And basically what I'm looking for there, for in my own personal life as well as my professional life, is that it's for, it's for somebody to be able to look at themselves in the mirror <clears throat> and say, this is who I am. The good, the bad, and the ugly, it's all part of me. And for anybody who's ever studied Gestalt therapy, but, you know, which was popular you know, decades ago, rec it, the emphasis there was on integrating the different parts of the self, which requires some self-compassion. Mm -hmm. It means that when you face the, the negative part of yourself, something that you are not proud of, you're still able to take a deep breath mm -hmm. and say, I can handle that. I, c I am not happy about it, but I, that does not mean I'm a worthless or hopeless person. I can find ways to learn from who I have been or what I've done wrong or mistakes I've made and do better with it. That's, that requires self-compassion. And I think one terminology that I think helps with that is the difference that, uh, that I always use and that plenty of other people do as well between shame and guilt. You know, guilt mm. is I have remorse for something I've done, I feel bad about it, and I want to use that to grow. I want to use that uh, to be a better person or not make the same mistakes in the future. And guilt I think is something that God or whomever gave us to be able to be better people. Shame is different. Shame is like, uh, there's something hopeless and pr profoundly defective about me. And shame is not our friend in any kind of counseling or clinical work. Once we have somebody, a, a man or a woman for that matter, who is experiencing a flood of shame, we have lost them. They, they freeze up or they turn, uh, they become, uh, going to counterattack mode against the person or circumstances that make them feel shameful. One qu quickie distinction is uh, guilt is I made a mistake. Shame is I am hmm. a mistake. And I never want any of the people I'm working with to harbor this belief that they are a mistake. I want them to recognize the mistakes but recognize also that there is a core better person in there who can learn from that and do it differently. I think your words have a lot of authority uh, given, I mean certainly everything you've done, but the fact that you work with perpetrators a lot of the time mm -hmm. and right. your world um, is domestic violence sometimes, so that distinction is its a really neat thing. Uh, well, we have I, to listen to you when you say that. Right, and I recognize that it is sometimes a stretch <laughs> to, to use try to use that kind of model, uh, and and what I always want to make sure and clarify when we're talking about domestic violence is that there's a certain small percentage of the men that I work with who I don't think are what I call good men behaving badly, mm -hmm. but I think are truly bad men behaving badly who are more the psychopaths mm -hmm. out there. But the vast majority of the other men I, I work with who've ended up in a program one way or another because of some sort of violent behavior towards their partner. They, there is a valuable and reachable guy in there somewhere 
that is masked by various kinds of uh, psychological and emotional issues and by some of the bad behaviors, but the bad behavior does not define the guy. What we tell people when they walk into our program is, we treat the man, not the abuser. When you walk in here, you're not a batterer, you're not a spouse abuser, you're not a wife beater, you are a guy, a man who's got multiple different components, his strengths, weaknesses. You're here because of a problem, but we are looking at you as, a, as the whole person and usually we're able to back that up with consistent attitudes and ways that we treat them. You uh, gave us some great examples from the mirror, broken mirror, and one of the things that really stood out to me was how, uh, as men, we do this broken mirror exercise, not person to person. Uh, the example you gave was the car. Right. Was the, will, will you talk to that a little so people who weren't here can, can get that idea? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the broken mirror idea, it's, it, it's most typically relevant or most gets, gets activated most in interpersonal situations. If I'm talking to my wife and she's critical of me about something, that can make me feel like I'm failing as a husband, I'm a loser, she's calling me, uh, she, she regrets marrying me, it can activate all these kind of shameful, uh, defective fears that I have about myself. And occasionally they might be, she might be actually saying that, <laughs> but, it, but for the, we're talking about all the situations where I, I overreact to it. And there are hundreds, thousands every year of interpersonal situations, ranging from really small ones to big ones, where any of us will have some broken mirror experience. The other kind, though, is that it doesn't have to be with a person. It could be uh, you, if, if, you, if your wife left you and that was devastating and it made you feel like an unlovable, unworthy person, and you pass by the restaurant where the two of you first met was your spot or whatever, that, that passing by that spot can activate the broken mirror feelings, or the example I gave in the talk, if you're if you got a job but you're not making as much money as you want, or you're unemployed, and your car has some dents in it, and you haven't been able to afford to fix them, you walk outside, you see your car, and it's like, oh no, that's a reminder to me that I am a loser, that I am I, I have fallen short of of meeting a standard of being able to be a successful guy who has an a good enough job where he has enough money where he can fix his damn car. And, and, and th those things can be, uh, can be activated all over the place. Well, it was really neat because it was one of those things you know is true, yeah. but I never could have put words around it until I heard it. So yeah. it was a g great example. I feel that way a lot of times when I go to other conferences or read right. other books where I, sometimes I don't learn anything radically new or isn't some totally different way that I would think about it or do it but it's just a reminder to me of, oh, I've experienced that, or I've done that clinically. I didn't have a name for it. I didn't have a, uh, a grid for how, how, how it works, but it confirms something that I just know to be true. Yeah. yeah. You had another one of those in there, and I think it's applicable to the recovery community. Uh, counseling of phobia. Talk to that a little bit inside of the recovery community because yeah. this is a real important subject to me personally and to a lot of us at Cedar is the counseling of phobia that can exist inside of the 12-step world. Yeah. Um, well, in any kind of counseling setting, individual therapy, couples therapy, group therapy, support groups, anything, whether, and whether it's that somebody's forced into a group like my domestic violence groups or it's voluntary, we're usually asking men to do things that are out of their comfort zone. We're asking them to sit in a room, and let's say in a, in a group therapy, group counseling setting, like at Cedar or somewhere else, we're asking them to sit in a room and talk about their feelings. Mm -hmm. We're asking them to identify ways in which they have felt helpless or powerless. We're asking them to trust that other people hearing their story will handle it with the sacred mm -hmm. touch that's, that, that, it, that it deserves. And we're also asking them to rely on other people to help them through it, whether it's their peers or somebody in a counseling, you know, a professional type position. And these are things that do not come easily to many men and that often trigger, mm -hmm. uh, I guess you'd call it certain broken mirror experiences. Like if I'm doing this, 
I must be weak. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing this, I must be defective. And those things, it's our job as in the counselors and therapy roles to be very respectful of how, uh, what that guy's experiencing when he first walks into that room or as he's going through some of the different stages of that process. Not, not respectful to the point where we don't expect anything, don't expect them to uh, reach out or do more, but to be very respectful of what it's taking out of him to be in that situation. And the more we know about the male psyche and some of these, you know, what I call broken mirror or shamophobia or narcissistic injury, the more we're aware of that, the more sensitized we can be to that. And as I talked about in the presentation, when these guys feel like we get it, mm -hmm. we get their experience, once we pass that test, my experience is the gates will often open and the most important work we're trying to do happens much easily, much more easily. Well, you gave some beautiful examples of how you counter that dread at the very beginning. Uh -huh. So two parts, and then just one more thing I'll ask you, but mm -hmm. two parts to this. How do you counter that dread at the very beginning when you've got a man who comes in who has all these rules he's about to be asked to throw in the trash? Yeah. One, and then two, um, well, if, if you could speak directly to the, the man who is thinking about taking that step but has that anxiety and tensing up when they're even thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, what, what would you tell him before he even came in to, to see? All right, well, let me talk about the second one first. I try to reframe what this, the, the help-seeking process is. It takes courage to ask for help. Mm -hmm. It takes brains. You have to really be, be able to look at the big picture and realize what's best. Mm -hmm. to ask for help. Um, if, um, if they have kids, um, the, the, one of the greatest gifts you can give to your children, and I know that most men deeply love their children. They may not always act in the most loving fashion, but I know they love them, mm -hmm. and they want to be, be a good model and, and uh, positive force in their lives, in those kids' lives. That one of the greatest gifts you can give your kids is to heal yourself, to make sure that you're not uh, engaging in behaviors in, within yourself or that affect others that are destructive. That's, uh, that's what a real man is able to do. So the, part of the way I try to pitch this is uh, speaking in guy language, courage, brains, mm -hmm. being a good father, being a real man, or uh, if they've, let's say if they've had grew up in an alcoholic family, which many people in, who abuse ha, have had that experience, unfortunately, I'll say, who's in control here? Do you want to be in control, or do you want the fact that you're, the way your father uh, ran his life and the way, he, the, way he, the way he did things all his life, do you want him to be making the decisions about how you run yours? Who's really in power here? Do you want to be that, or do you want your, your father to be that? And that, and most men will say, I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to be in charge, not my old man, not him. And we're trying to reframe the help-seeking process as examples of manhood in some of that different language. So that's one of the ways I deal with that it's powerful. one. powerful. Yeah. And uh, the other thing you asked about was once men are, are walking into that room or about to walk into that room, what are some things we can do to help um, help relax some of their fears and their defenses. And one is what I call therapeutic transparency, which is basically making sure that before they walk in there, we spell it out for them. We say, here's what happens in one of these groups. We start out by doing this, and then we have this little ritual, we go around and do this. And then somebody starts talking about these, and here's some of the typical issues that we talk about. Here's some of the problems that sometimes come up when somebody tries to do problem solving too much for another person, or when they uh, they get judgmental about another person. We know that those are things that mess up the group and whenever we catch that, we try to nip it. If we hear somebody making comments that, are, that uh, se seem sexist or racist, we really try to you know, uh, push, that, push that out of the room. That doesn't belong in these groups. Here's the things that people do do that are real successful. So we just try to give as much information. And I know you put me in a new social situation, I'm gonna wanna know, okay, well how do, 
what do they do here first? Thing? First they mill around on a cocktail party, and then they go to dinner, or are we going straight to dinner? What's going to happen here? And, and what are the subjects that people usually talk about? I want to know these things so I don't feel blindsided by what takes place. And then um, the other thing I tell uh, men coming into a group is, we are very patient with you. There are people who walk in here. Some people hit the ground running. They say, hello, my name's David. Here's my story. I've got things I want to talk about. Plenty of other guys, they want to take a step back and watch what's happening. Make sure that they understand the rules and regs or the, the sort of the, the policy, the, uh, the ways of operating. They want to make sure that there is a safety zone. They want to see how people are talking to each other. And then at some point, they'll put their toe in the water and see what happens. And what we usually find with our groups is once you put your toe in, then you put your big foot in, the whole foot in, and then eventually you get baptized. I mean, you end up going through, uh, you're able to do more because it works. But nobody should do that until they feel like the group, in a, in a way, has passed the test of letting them know that this is a safe place to be open in the ways that, that we ask people to do. And, he nice. and hearing some of those things really, it helps to relax them. Awesome advice. Um, you could sit and talk all day, and, mm -hmm. and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but close us out with um, the definition that you gave of relational heroism. I thought the whole idea was wonderful and very liberating. So tell us about relational heroism. Yeah, that's a term that I've, I learned from uh, Terry Reel, who wrote the book, I Don't Want to Talk About It. And in this book, he talks about this. Uh, and the notion here is that in our relationships, we keep running into situations, so sometimes on a daily basis, everyday little stuff, where there's a fork in the road. We could do it the old way that would be easier for us, would be, uh, w wouldn't, uh, wouldn't push us to go outside of our comfort zone, might make us feel more in control of the situation, um, but is likely to perpetuate a lot of the negative patterns that have been there for a long time. Or we can suck it up and say, I want to try something different. It's difficult for me. It's new. I feel a little risky, but I'm reasonably confident it's for the greater good, for me and my wife, for me and my kids, for anybody else who might be involved. And ultimately, if that's true, it's going to be good for me as well. But it takes courage to do that. And we can have even everyday little situations, like if uh, your kids are acting up in some way. And what you're used to doing is just sort of snapping them at them and saying something you know, harsh to really put them down because that's what your father did. That gets the point across. They're a little scared of you. You get to watch your football game now and not have to bother, bother with them. <laughs> that's the, that might be the old way. It's easier that way. But a different way might be finding some other way to communicate with them, maybe to distract them or to talk to them about what it is they're upset about perhaps to interrupt something that might be selfish, more selfish for you or more self-centered that, that you want to do, take more time to put into them, the rewards of doing that are usually tremendous. Not only for the other person, in this example your kids or your partner, but also ultimately it comes back to you. And I have you know, hundreds of examples of guys who've done the relation, a relationally heroic act and discovered how much better they felt and how much better their relationships were with the key people in their lives, which ultimately overrode whatever fear or loss they were, they, they were experiencing by giving up the, the, the first fork in the road. So we all have that chance every day to be relational heroes, and when we do it, we should damn well celebrate it. We should. Yeah. It was really neat having Terry kick us off yesterday, yeah. you kick us off today, uh -huh. and seeing that uh, the, the similarities in the work, the mm -hmm. importance in the work. Um, we, we're so proud to have had you here, and thank you very much for being a part of this, and um, look forward to having you out again. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Okay.